Ladies and gentlemen, let's get ready to rumble. Please welcome Mick Ebeling of Not Impossible Labs and Bob Moore of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So welcome everybody, it's, it's an honor to be here. Um, I'm Bob Moore, here to introduce Mick. Mick and I met a short two months ago uh, we were at a forum where Mick was presenting some information on some of the projects he did at Not Impossible Labs. Sort of blew me away, and one of the members of the audience was also Richard Branson, who sort of threw down a gauntlet at that point, said, you know, one of the, one of the impossible problems is feeding the hungry. So we want you to go out and feed the hungry. And I, I'm blown away by the way Mick attacks problems, the way he attacks everything, probably me next. Um, but you're going to hear from, from Mick on, on Not Impossible and what he's doing, some of the projects he's done in the past, and how he's using common sense and, and technology that already exists just to sort of push the swing and get things moving. And he'll talk specifically about a couple things, but Hunger Not Impossible to focus. Thanks, sir. How's everyone doing? I, I hate to be that guy, but how's everyone doing? There we go. Good. Um, Super excited to be here today. I, how many of you guys know about, it's so hard to see, I feel like I'm being interrogated. Uh, how many of you guys know about Not Impossible? Sweet. Three people. Wah! Nice. Um, well, hopefully you guys know a little bit more after this. So not, I'm the CEO and founder of Not Impossible Labs, and Not Impossible Labs is basically kind of like what it says on the name. We look at things that are impossible and try to make them not impossible. And the mission of what we do, our mission statement, is to change the world through technology and story. And for us, um, you know, I'm a Venice Beach kid, so I'm out in Venice Beach, come up and come through the production world. So storytelling for us is essentially how we tell the world what we're doing. But our definition of technology, that key part for us, is it's technology, but we look at it as technology for the sake of humanity. And what that means for us is, how do you take something, how do you modify it, how do you hack it, how do you, you know, maybe skew it a little differently, not necessarily have to invent something that's completely new, but take something that maybe exists and make it so that it accomplishes a fundamental human and social need. And then, how do you make it accessible? How do you make it so that people have access to whatever that solution is? So, that's what technology for the sake of humanity means. And so, the way that, we have done this in the past, just a little historical, uh, for, not for the three people that raised their hand, for the other people. Uh, there's been a couple projects that we've worked on. Uh, one of them is called the iRider, right there, to my right, your left. Uh, this was a guy that we discovered, an amazing artist named Temp, Temp One. He was a graffiti artist in LA. We discovered his story, and he had been laying in a bed motionless for seven years due to ALS, unable to communicate and unable to draw. And we went, wait a second, that's not right. He, he should be able to express himself again. So I pulled together this team of incredible talent, brilliant minds, and we made a device called the iRider, which allowed him with a cheap pair of sunglasses from the Venice Beach boardwalk, a coat hanger, some duct tape and zip ties, there's usually duct tape and zip ties in everything we touch, uh, focused back on the pupil, and with his eyes, he was able to draw again for the first time in seven years. And that was kind of our, thank you. Yeah. Um, so that was our first, that was the spark, basically, that lit the fire. We're like, wait, this is cool. We gotta do more of this. So we started to go through this, and our next project that we did a couple years later was a project called Project Daniel. And I read a story about a young boy named Daniel who had both of his arms blown off. He was living in Sudan in the Nuba Mountains, and Bashir had, you know, Bashir's people had hit him with one of their, uh, their, their bombs, of shrapnel bombs, and he lost both of his arms. And when I read his story, I was like, that's just, that's just not right. That's, that shouldn't be that way. This kid is going to live his life without, without arms and without be able to take care of himself. So we said, all right, that's absurd. We've got to change it. And I went out and I set up the world's first 3D printing prosthetic laboratory. And we made with super basic 3D printers and we were able to figure out how to navigate gigantic bugs that dive bombed our printer in the middle of the night and surges in electricity and all these other things. We were able to make an arm for Daniel so that he could feed himself for the first time in two years. But then we were also able to train his village so that with the potential, they would have the potential to continue on making arms after we left. 
So that gives you kind of like a, a snapshot of, of what we do and, and how we tackle these supposed impossible projects, which if you haven't guessed already, I don't believe in the concept of impossible. It's a total, total fallacy. So the way that it starts for us is what we call the revolution against the absurd, right? When you see something from a human standpoint, just a human standpoint, not an intelligence or expertise, but just from a human standpoint that you look at and you're like, that's absurd. That, it shouldn't be that a guy with ALS can't communicate or draw. It shouldn't be that a boy who loses his arms in a developing world can't, can't you know, feed himself. That's absurd. We go out and we try to change it. So it's not from an intelligence expertise or having the solution. It's about saying, it's just from a human level, we have to change that. And the way that we do it is we have a very simple formula. And the formula is, you go, I got to do it. <laughs> we just got to do it. And then you figure out how you're going to do it. So we call it commit, then figure it out. It's not have a solution and then go deploy it. It's you jump, woo, and you, then you, start, you go and figure it out, and you start to assemble brilliant minds around you, and, and that's how we get it done. So part of that kind of recognition of the absurd is we started to look at different things and statistics that, that we feel are absurd. And the thing that we're passionate about right now are the statistics around hunger. And this is a global issue, but I'll talk about it just from our country standpoint right now. But this statistic, would you all agree in this room that that's absurd? That's what? That doesn't make any sense. How about this? That's that one in three veterans that come back, one in three homeless people are veterans, these people that go out and serve their country, and they come back and they're homeless or hungry. Would you agree that that's absurd? Yes. How about this? How about one in five of our kids in this country, they live in a food insecure environment? Absurd? All right, so you start to look at these things, you know, wait a second, and then you break it down and you realize that it's not caused because we don't have enough food. We, it's not a scarcity issue. It's an access. They just, we can't get the food to the people who need it. So we said, all right, that's ridiculous. We have to change it. That's the absurdity. And so we started to delve into this a little deeper. And here's a crazy thing. How many, um, quick test, pop, chip, or pop quiz. Of the homeless youth, food, clothing, shelter. What of those three things do you think they prioritize most? It's a trick question. None of them. Given those three things, given four things, the fourth thing, they choose a cell phone over food, shelter, and clothing. They will choose a cell phone. And statistically, most, I'm sure many of you know, seven billion people on the planet, six billion of them have cell phones. So statistically, homeless people have cell phones. So we went, all right, this is interesting. This is interesting. Let's figure out how to use the thing that they have as a way to create a solution. Use technology for the sake of humanity. So we basically launched Hunger Not Impossible. And Hunger Not Impossible is really based pretty much on the premise of how most of you probably got here today if you didn't take the train, which is what? Probably an Uber, right? And on the way over here, we were discussing what Hunger Not Impossible is, and the Uber driver goes, so wait a second, so you basically have created an Uber, but for food for hungry people? And I'm like, sweet, this talk's gonna go well. If he just overhears me saying it, these people understand what the heck we're doing. <laughs> and that's essentially what we're doing. We're basically using the cell phone as a way to have someone who's hungry be able to tie in to a mesh network of participating restaurants to actually go and get a meal. But they get a meal and they get it in a way that's dignified. When they walk in and redeem their meal, they are not Mick the homeless person. They are not Mick the the dirty, poorly dressed, just, they don't go in with a sense of shame and try, they go in and they're just Mick redeeming a meal. That's it. And that's a massive issue within this community in terms of what motivates them. So who benefits and how does this actually work? How does this, this thing come together? The restaurants benefit, back to the Uber thing. You guys know about surge pricing, right? Think of the inverse of surge pricing. Restaurants during times of in between meals, it's crickets, right? It's empty. There's nobody in there. What if there was a way for us to actually use that whole collision of supply and demand where there's existing supply and a demand and we collide it during opportune strategic times where the restaurants actually had a bunch of people just standing around there, electricity and griddles and, 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 and air conditioning going, if we can actually put people in there to use their things and they could make money that way. So it's the inverse, it's inverse surge pricing they have an opportunity to make money when they wouldn't. Charities and NGOs and schools, 
The, there's lots of noble institutions that want to feed people. They can't feed everybody all the time. It's where people are located, the transient population of where they're trying to feed them. So asking someone to come to a food, uh, a soup kitchen or a place to feed, that's just, it's, it's improbable to be able to feed someone all the time. So how do they benefit? Now they have a way to augment their existing system to where if you can't actually get to the kitchen that's helping them, they can go to a restaurant that's closer and more convenient for them. And then the last is what I just said, it's the convenience. The convenience of people being able to go to restaurants that are close to them, because if you're out trying to get a job or trying to make some money, but the only way you can eat is to go take a bus and a train to get someplace to do it, guess what? You're gonna opt out and you're gonna try to stay and make some money. And we heard that time and time again from people. So this is a, these are two of our guys right here that just finished our program at a pilot that we just finished. As Bob said, we've already done this. Like this isn't a, probability, like wouldn't it be nice? We've just concluded a three-week trial of Hunger Not Impossible, and it works. And these are two kids from the Safe Place for Youth, the group that we just worked with, and they told us the stories that we started to hear from them was like, listen, if you're out and about, and you're trying to actually get ahead, but you realize, oh man, I'm hungry, but I can't get all the way over there to get it. What Hunger Not Impossible did for us is it got us a chance to be able to go get a sandwich or go get a meal and then get back to doing whatever we needed to do. And this is one of my, uh, this is one of my favorite things that was said by Ryan. But that second line where he says, when you feed us, it means we don't have to do, go do other nasty things for money for food. Right? We don't have to go sell drugs. We don't have to do things like that. And when our stomach is touching our back, we can't think straight. It's like, if you want to make a change, you got to start, you, no one can start making changes in their life when they're starving. So we see this as something that, yes, we're going to deal with the hunger problem, but what are the residual effects of this? Could we affect kids going to school more? Yes. Could we affect people actually going and working and getting jobs and actually trying to get ahead? Yes. Could we affect crime and, and people stealing for food? Yes. Could we affect our veteran population being depressed or suicidal because they can't even feed themselves? Yes, all of these things, but it starts here. It starts here. If we can deal with this, we can deal with so much more, so much more. So what I would say to you guys today, within Hunger Not Impossible, if you're a restaurant, if you know a restaurant, if you're a charity, an NGO, a school, if you have if you know someone who's hungry and you want to be involved with Hunger Not Impossible, this is a platform that we give to these organizations to deploy so that they can do the things. The restaurants want to churn food. Charities and NGOs want to feed and help people. The hungry, they just want to eat. So if you know any of those people who can benefit from this, send them our way. Thank you guys very much. <laughs>